All right, folks, welcome back to this edition of Against the Ropes. I'm your host, Rich Quinones. We'll continue to talk a little boxing. We'll switch gears. We talked a lot about Glenn Tapia. We had Pat Lynch on earlier today. We're going to switch gears, talk a little female boxing on the line. A great guest, fresh off another title win. That, of course, is Maureen Shea as she just dispatched Angel Gladney for the vacant IFBA International Female Boxers Association Super Bantamweight title. That bout was uh, over the weekend, last weekend in California. She's kind enough to join us for a couple moments. And uh, Maureen, first and foremost, we appreciate a couple moments. How are you feeling after you win? Oh, I feel great. I feel great. You know, it, it, was, it was really exciting. I mean, there's so much to talk about. Just, you know, um, just the, you know, the whole promotion as a whole, fighting on Saturday night, and then seeing my teammates being a female main event, fighting for a world title. Um, this fight, I was, I was, I was, well, the last fight I fought out here with top players promotions, I was on the cover of the local paper, which was such an honor, and sharing my story and my, my struggle in what brought me to California, and then being the fight, uh, being up on a billboard. I mean, they had me up on, on, on two billboards up here in Ventura County, and it was just amazing. Just everything has been amazing. You know, and it's interesting, too, because a lot of people, I mean, they know you because of when a lot of people saw the movie Million Dollar Baby and so many of the nicknames that you have. But if they don't really understand boxing and female boxing, they're not really privy to knowing your background and how you actually got started uh, in boxing. And, you know, like many women, you had to deal with abuse uh, in a situation in a relationship and a lot of women have have gone through that as well and you've kind of used that as an outlet um, and I'll tell you it's a testament to a lot of people per se but talk a little bit about that for a moment and just how you were able to you know show that strength go away and then and then all of a sudden use all that energy uh, if you will into boxing and pursuing your passion and career well you know it's funny because it really all started with self-esteem for me and it started with um, with depression depression that I've had my whole life. Um, for me, getting into that relationship uh, was, was a self-esteem issue, and it was when I, I thought I was strong, and then I was weak because I was going through depression, and, um, and I was just battling. And when I met that individual, I was going through one of my depressions, and somebody was, was paying attention to me. He was, you know, he cared, he was nice, he was sympathetic, and I, and I believed him, and I trusted him, and I was vulnerable. And a lot of women fall into those, those abusive situations because they are vulnerable. And they don't know how to balance their strength with their vulnerability. Because don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with being vulnerable. I think there's true strength in vulnerability. But there's, there's also a moment where people prey on the vulnerable. And that's what happened to me. And, but when I went into the gym, again, I put myself in a vulnerable position. But I was stronger. And I went into the gym, you know, scared. I was, I was in a relationship with him, but I wanted to better myself. And actually, at the time, it was for him. At least so I thought it was for him. But I think deep down, spiritually, it was, it was really for me. And um, when I went to that gym, I, just, I fought my way out of it, literally. You know, I showed up every day. I faced the battle every day, uh, going in there, being the only female, um, struggling with my own demons. Uh, him, you know, thinking about him. Is he cheating on me? What's he doing? Um, does he care about me? I mean, it was just a constant fight. You know, I just finding the strength inside the gym and just... Finding the straight within myself and getting to know myself and understand how I function, what works for me, what doesn't work for me. And it's a process that anybody listening to this can totally relate in some way. You have to fight every day. Some of us will admit that we have those struggles, some of us don't. But that's the vulnerability. When you can admit that you're not perfect, admit that you have these issues. I still go through it daily. I go to therapy every week. I need therapy because you know what? It keeps me on track. It keeps me honest with myself. Because once you start lying to yourself and you're afraid of that or you're afraid of that vulnerability, you know, you really stop growing. And I think people become afraid of the vulnerability because they get taken advantage of, because they can't find their strength. But it's because they're not admitting that they're vulnerable. They made a mistake. It's okay. You know, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay that we allow ourselves to be vulnerable and people prey on us. It's life, it's the world, it's business, it's boxing, it's everything. It's every day. So to be able to find that strength, you know, for me was just, you know, it was just the beginning. The beginning of my of my life because I really started to work on myself uh, there on after every day. Yeah, it's interesting too because I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's okay. Um, everyone goes through a lot of uh, adversity and obstacles and challenges in life. And you're right, if you can't be true to yourself, uh, you certainly can't be uh, true to those around you. Uh, one thing that you have been true to, and that's certainly success in the ring, it, to me, it, it really is ultimately when you look at some of the great fighters 
in this country, let alone the world. And we, we will look at the featherweight division and we look at your division and we, we know some of the names already, uh, the Rolando Andrews and the Jennifer Tates and the Carla Torres and Veronica Jeffries. Then there's yourself and you've won title after title and you've got such a high ranking right now. And I know there's you know, such a, a lot of respect with the IFBA and also NABA, uh, the WIBA, which does a lot for female boxing. But what I find interesting is that a lot of the female fighters that I talk to, a lot of them are probably in their mid to late 20s, and some of them are just starting out in the game in the early 30s. And what I found in covering the sport is that it's okay if you're a female boxer to have a late start in the game. There's absolutely nothing yeah. wrong with that. Conversely, it'd be a tougher really for a guy because of the weight classes, maybe the level of competition per se. But you know, you're 32, 33 years of age. I'm not saying you're a late bloomer to the game, but you've had a lot of success now for almost a decade. So Again, I, I think for a lot of the females boxers out there that you can speak to, it's okay if you're getting a late start in this game. Well, I think I think you know what? There's benefits and there's detriment to it, in my opinion. The benefit is I did not even know who I was as a woman until I hit thirty. When I hit thirty, I always see this. I feel like like it's like an older like I never thought I'd be saying this to somebody, but I meet girls that are like twenty seven, twenty six, and I'm like, oh, wait till you hit thirty, everything makes sense. <laughs> did you know everything now? You don't know anything. Then I meet women in their forties, and they're like, "Oh, honey, wait for you at forty. But that's what's amazing about just the evolution of women. You know what I mean? And just the growth and everything. And I tell you know when I meet girls that you know, all right. So the, 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 let me let me stick to it. The, the detriment to me, you're learning a craft, and you have to teach your body how to work a certain way. And there's some girls out there that have been doing it for years. For example, myself, I started boxing at nineteen. I've been doing this a really long time. You know, so when you're older. It might be a little bit harder, but it's, but you're mentally stronger in your 30s and your late 20s. So I think that, you know, I went through a lot of stuff I probably didn't have to go through because I started younger. So I, I made things harder on myself because I was young. And my mind was young, my body was young, I didn't understand, I struggled. But now, knowing the things I know now, if I started now, I think I, just because I know how mentally strong I am, I'd be fine. So those women just have to, they have to realize, don't think about the age, don't think about your body, think about your mind. And work with your body because it'll work, you know. And and but the good thing, and the good thing, that's that's what the good thing is, is that they're they're more mature. They understand. They're more patient. The younger girls aren't as patient. They're not as mentally tough because they haven't lived enough life yet. It's not just about going through the struggles in the ring. It's about going through the struggles outside the ring that will make you stronger all the way around as, as a woman. And um, and so I think it's I think it's great. I think it's each individual has their own path. And there's a reason why these girls come in the game later on in their careers. There's a reason. You know, and they may have to work a little bit harder in other areas, physically or, or knowledge, understanding, things like that. But as you're 30, then in your late 20s, you're just so much more mature. And you make, you understand, as long as you can apply those life lessons to the lessons in the ring, because they, they really work back and forth. Maureen Shea joining us for a couple moments on this edition of Against the Ropes. I'm your host, Rich Quinones. Talk a little bit about uh, dispatching Gladney to win another title. You got the TKO in the fourth round. It's interesting, 26, 27 fights in your career, good knockout power, 12 knockouts. What were you able to do in this one against opponent who, again, you kind of throw the record out the window because I, I, I don't look at records, whether they're lopsided or not, because it could be an, a, a good test for you. There could have been adjustments in that fight, but what were you able to do to yeah. overcome that and get that fourth round TKO? Well, it was the first time I ever fought at, at uh, 122. And, um, you know, that was the first time, and nobody's ever seen me fight at four as high as 140 pounds. Um, but I, I felt really good at 122, really strong, really solid. And uh, I, uh, you know, the first round, I, I dropped her with a straight right left hook. Um, and it was one of those punches you don't throw hard. Right. You just throw it, and it lands, and it hit him on the button. Um, she went down, and then after that, I kind of just started to, uh, you know, do my work. And uh, go to the body, go to the head, uh, use my combinations, use my speed, and, and just my technique. And uh, in the final round, I mean, she was fully breaking down. Um, the girl was tough. She's very tough, but I can see it. I can feel it. The, the, the girl that I had met at the way in, the girl that walked into that ring with the confidence, I, I started feeling the will, you know, and a little bit like that, like, oh, that overwhelming. But um, she kept coming back. She kept coming back. And then the final, the, the fourth round, the ref stopped the fight. And I, to the credit of the ref, I, I give a lot of credit. Could she have gone on? Yeah, she probably could have. But you know what? She wasn't, I mean, she wasn't responding. So if she came out the next round or she would continue to take that kind of, a, you know, that kind of, of punches. You know, receiving those kinds of blows, I, it's not necessary because I was just going to get stronger. 
I'm, I'm, I'm a round fighter, and that was only the fourth. So it would have just probably gotten a little bit more uh, brutal after that. Yeah, and we. So I think the rest did the right thing, and uh, it was stopped. Yeah, and we've seen fighters get stronger as the fight progresses. You alluded to, and you're right. I mean, uh, you just you, you kind of know when you've you've you broken your opponent's will. And a lot of people do question stoppages at times, but first and foremost, uh, you want to protect the fighter. Uh, a couple more quickies for you. When you look at, and I'm sure you've been asked this a thousand times, the state of female boxing. Every female fighter that I speak to, when I ask them what needs to be done to really help promote the sport, a lot of them, it's almost a split. A lot of them. I would have to say 60, 65%, maybe 60, 65% say we need the TV exposure. And then another 35, 40% will turn around and say, well, we just need to continue to market the sport on their own, which when I kind of push them for that, it's more or less just canvassing, so to speak, out and about and just showing your face. What, Where do you see the state of female boxing from when you started? And the fact that you were one of the first fighters to fight on on television, um, on uh, Lou DiBella's Broadway Boxing, and we, we just saw Heather Hardy fight on an undercard. So uh, talk a little bit about that and, and where you think uh, female boxing, the direction it's headed. Oh, I think it's headed in a really good direction, and I think it's only a matter of time. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, especially with Lou, you know, fighting Heather thing and I'm honored because I remember when Lou didn't like female boxing and I remember when Lou said you know what Maureen I'm going to put you on not because I think you're cute but I think you can fight and that was a huge breakthrough for me you know to have him see that you know somebody like Lou DeBella and Bob Harum and like they ended up to come and you know I think the face of women's boxing you know things like that I, um, I think the promoter's eyes are opening and that's important I think it's not just that but it's also the promoters backing these females um, I think the televised mouths absolutely um, TV exposure is huge and it's going to help and it's, I mean, the girls in Mexico, the women in Mexico, the purses are bigger, yeah. the women are making, they're on TV, they're constantly televised, you know, and I think that it's a matter of time before the U.S. Um, uh, promote, excuse me, the promoters do the same thing. Um, I think as far as the individual females go, I think that they need to market themselves. It's a job, you know, and it's a full-time job. It's your life. It's your livelihood. So you put your, the more you put yourself out there, the more people are going to get to know you. I'm a people person. I just, even if I wasn't boxing, I would still be out meeting people and doing things. Whether I be in promotions, whether I be whatever, I love to meet people. I love to hear their stories. I love to share my stories and experiences and just grow as a human. And lucky for me, part of being a female boxer is going out there meeting people and sharing your story. And I think that that's important. And um, just connecting with the people because once they get to know you on a personal level, it really helps with your with your marketability. I mean, when I fought, uh, you know, last Friday at the, I mean, the love that I felt in that place. I mean, I'm a New Yorker. Born and raised in the Bronx, there for 30 years. I moved out here three years ago, you know, and I still go back to New York, but the amount of love that I felt when I fought those two times here in Oxnard, it's amazing because I have a family out here now. I have a place here now, and it's because I went out there and I met everybody, and I and I just stayed, you know, I just stayed um, accessible, and it helped me grow as a person because if I could have stayed shacked up in a house and just by myself and just went to the gym every day and came back and just did that out here and didn't go out into the community and meet people and... And, and form uh, form family out here almost, you know? Uh, I could have not done that, and then where would I be? But it wouldn't have been as great. You know, yeah, I still would have been fighting, maybe, I still, but I w it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't feel as good, you know? So I think that that's important. So with the marketing and the TV, I think it's a combination of all of it. But it's really up to the individual to keep going and not feel like, oh, it's never going to happen. Or, oh, this is just, you know, obstacles are what get in the way when you lose sight of your goal. So as long as each individual female fighter out there keeps sight of her goal, walks her path, doesn't follow anybody else, just takes notes and does their own thing, I think that um, it's going to happen. And I, I'm one of those women. When you look at yourself and then you look at, say, uh, a Mia St. John, an Ann Wolf, a Christy Martin, uh, a Regina Helmick, um, the list can go on and on. Um, uh -huh. And Ali, uh -huh. you know, um, even to, you know, people who right now who might start following the sport a little more, girls like... Uh -huh. um, uh, and, uh, you know, a Heather Hardy, a Christina Cruz, who's a wonderful Golden Gloves champ, or an Ava Knight, uh -huh. the likes of that. Uh -huh. Do you consider yourself one of the ambassadors of the sport, and, and, and is that a role that you relish? You know, I, I really, you know, I, I just I just walk my path. You know, my favorite quote is, do not go where the path may lead, go, with, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And that's Ralph Emerson. And I believe that that's the goal, and that's what I stick to every day. And if I can help influence or help motivate or help inspire any of these other women to do it, I'm honored. 
I'm just walking my path and just keeping my horse blinders on and walking forward in what I need to do with me and my team. You know, we have a vision, we have a goal, and that's what we're doing. And if I can, if it helps anybody else, you know, I think it's great. And I, and I see what Mia did. I see what, what, what Layla did. I see what Ann Wolf did. You know, and I can relate. And there's things that I, I learned from them. Um, there's things I've learned that I want to do. There's things I've learned that I don't want to do. You know, but I, I listen and I look and I see, but I, I follow my own path. And, and that's, that's, I think that's, for me, been what's led to my success. It's because I didn't do what everybody else told me to do or what everybody else think I, thinks I should do or listen to the critics, listen to the people that were telling me how it'll be better and you'll get there faster if you do it this way or that way. I trusted in God because I have faith and I trust in my team. The people that I have around me, my manager, Luis Ilchese, who's been in my life since I was 21 years old, who really took me in literally into the boxing gym when I was turned away in other boxing gyms because I was a female. And I stuck with the team that I have. Joseph Jaddick, the trainer I have now, Amazing. You know, he's, he's great. He's amazing. And, he, and, he, and he, he writes in the same book as us. And that's what's important. Keeping the people around you that share your common interests, that, um, that can relate to you, and that, that live the similar lives. They're good people. You know, for me, that's, that's what helps a lot. But as far as taking on that, that role or, or title or, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't really like to, I don't like to go with the titles, you know. But it, like I said, if I can help or inspire or motivate or uh, teach, that's great. I, I, I'm honored that I can do that. Well, you kind of answered a couple of uh, my follow-up questions, which was great. So you read my mind. That's what happens. You know, you got two New Yorkers on the phone. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, where, you know, where, where do you see yourself as far as uh, continuing finding? Because we know you've done some great work as an analyst and, and, and color commentator as well. Is that something you might see yourself yeah. doing a little more of um, when you retire? Absolutely. Absolutely. And even before I retire. You know, I'm going to be doing, uh, you know, venturing out more into that, too. Um, I do it at home when I watch the fights. And I watch them, and I'm sitting there, and I'm critiquing, and I have people over. Or, you know, and I actually just started getting into the UFC um, in the past year or so, not just because of Ronda, but because my boyfriend's a huge UFC fan, and when we first met, he knew nothing about boxing. All I had to hear about was the UFC, and, and I was like, oh, God, i got to learn what he likes. And I was just, ah, UFC, whatever. But you know what? I'm learning about that, too. And, and I even working on just, you know, understand what's going on with those. I mean, they're athletes, and I respect them. So it is, yeah, it's definitely something that I definitely want to do. I, I want to. I'm going to. Um, but there's so many. You know, I'm so fortunate, Rich, that I really feel and believe that I can do anything I want in this world. Anything. If I want to stop everything and go back to school and become a lawyer, which was something that I thought about doing when I was younger, I can do it. I can do anything I want because because I have the desire, I have the passion, I have the discipline. And, you know, when you get in that ring and you fight in front of a lot of people, uh, you know, you pretty much can become invincible almost. You pretty much think you can do anything. So... It's just the confidence and, and, and just going forward with life and, and, um, and you know, just achieving anything you want to achieve. Some people call her the Bronx bombshell. Some call her real million dollar baby. Others just call her Mo. We call her champ. Uh, great, <laughs> great insight. Another huge win. Another title on your resume. And I know uh, as far as if you have a website in closing or Twitter or Instagram, anything you want to uh, plug or a little uh, shout out before we let you go, uh, have at it. I do. Well, I just want to thank everybody, all my fans out there. I mean, there's fans that I've had, I remember, that have them on Facebook, and they followed me since my million-dollar baby days, since I was an amateur, you know, and I'm just, and I always said, it's gonna, you're in for a ride, you're gonna jump on, you know, you're gonna jump on this uh, this train, it's gonna, it's gonna be something, and it's been, it's been a long time, it's been great, but um, everybody, you know, that follows me, can follow me on, on Facebook at um, Maureen, the real million-dollar baby, Shay, that's my fan page, I, I stay on that, um, my, my personal page has too many, I have too many friends, so I can't, Except anybody else, but um, follow me on that on Instagram, Maureen underscore Shay, and on Twitter, uh, at Maureen Shay. And uh, you know, I appreciate everybody. I have some amazing sponsors out there too. You know, I have uh, local sponsors here. I have uh, the top players. They're the Players Casino sponsors me, and uh, uh, Harris Water. I have a water sponsor, which is huge for me because it's all I drink. So I'm just really fortunate to have these sponsors. Jasuru, um, the BioCell blend too. That they've They've been a huge backer of mine, too. So I'm just really fortunate and lucky and glad and, and honored that these people believe in me and they back me, and especially my fans. I really appreciate everybody. And hey, Rich, thank you for having me on today. Well, we appreciate you jumping on board for a couple moments on this edition of Against the Rope. So there you have it, Maureen Shea, another title, the real million-dollar baby. All right, folks, we will talk to you next week. And again, I'm Rich Canunas. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Rich Q on QTumblr.com, on Q Sports. You can also check us out on RingNews24.com and, of course, BoxingLexTalk.com. Everyone have a good week. We'll talk to you next time on Against the Ropes.